speed of the process. So if your gene processes adrenaline, adrenaline, which Kim talked about, is slow, that means you have an excess amount, which means that you actually have a much higher perception of stress. You're going to have a much higher response to strain than somebody else. So there's a gene that processes dopamine. Right. Dopamine is our reward hormone, right? People that have a very slow processing gene for dopamine, it also processes estrogen, so there's a huge cancer risk as well, are going to be more susceptible to stressful situations and respond in a much more stressful way. Because what I tell people, like their cup is already overflowing, right? People that have like a very low dopamine, which means that the gene is working very quickly, it's the speed of how it breaks down the hormones you're making, right? There is a lot of room for stress, right? Because you have you're not running very high in the dopamine. You could build more and respond to stress. That's kind of what that that's what we're talking so the, about. It's the expression, genes, but it's how you're it's how they're expressing behaving. So that's yeah. called epigenetics. What you're looking. Yeah, that's called epigenetics, yeah. right? Epigenetics are influenced by mm -hmm. So then we take that information and we make a really yeah. tailored, tailored plan. We have a question in the back. Can different lifestyle changes affect that yes. epigenetics? Yes, you yeah. yeah, 100%. Um, so that's why we do that, because then we can tailor what lifestyle support we can do um, and how we can strengthen or optimize those genetic expressions for you um, yeah. on a lot of different levels. Yeah. I have three more questions about cancer. Okay. Do you take patients who have never had cancer? Yes. Do you time. take insurance? Yeah. And then what would be the approximate cost of the gamut of tests? Oh, well, that's different. So we don't run the whole gamut of tests on everybody. So okay. when we do an intake, uh, specifically with me and, and with Dr. Calvin, he does it similarly, uh, it's an hour. And so I'm getting, you're downloading me on what's going on in your body, and I'm running my database. And I'm going, I think this system or this system or this system, and these are the things that we need to do to check those systems, okay. right? So that it would depend. So, you, okay, so there's nothing standard. Everybody gives microtoxin, everybody gives whatever. Okay. 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 Although I will tell you, I run a lot of stool panels these days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really into the microbiome. It's I have a question. Um, years ago, I had radioactive iodine because my thyroid, yeah, off oh, now. So what do you do? Is there anything you can do? That, did you do anything to that, uh, Dr. Jeffrey? So, said I don't have a thyroid. Right. Yeah. So I, there's there's a there are a number of things you do. So first of all, um, so thyroid is a so, so there there are three hormones. Well, that's actually a very fairly detailed question, but I'll try to be very brief. But the three <laughs> the, the three hormones that I call the the starter buttons for the lawnmower. The lawnmower right. is our cell. So if you right. take an analogy of a of a lawnmower, let's say first thing first day you want to mow the lawn, you take it out of the garage. What do you do? You put oil and gas in the tank, unless it's electric, right? right. Well, that's your cell. So that's nutrition, right? You know. Well, it's not going to run, right, until you push a button, right. right? That button, that starter button, is three hormones that work on that. It's thyroid, growth hormone, and either testosterone or estrogen, or males or females, right? So thyroid, if you don't have, if you're lacking that, right, you're lacking the starter for the cell, mm -hmm. which means the cell is not going to function efficiently. It will not process Nutrients effectively will not it will not it will not it will not make energy effectively and it will also not eliminate toxins effectively because toxin elimination is an elimination is an energy expensive process right it's pushing things out against gradient so it's great against current so I think that mitochondrial or cellular optimization is always essential that we do a lot of that right. Um, then there's this whole concept of just having any kind of radioactive isotopes in your body in general. They're direct, what we call cellular or mitochondrial disruptors, right? So there is a huge problem there. So then we try to heal the mitochondria, right? Correct them, you know, correct some of those impairments. Uh, and then, of course, there's a whole, you know, it just depends on what's left. I mean, are you on thyroid? I'm assuming I'm thyroid. you're on thyroid supplement, right? And then there's this whole concept of if you've disrupted the cell's ability to function properly, right? 
you've also disrupted your cell's ability to convert the less, less active thyroid to a more active thyroid. Because what happens is the synthroid that everybody gets, right, is something that's called T4, right? T4 is a precursor in most ways, right? to a more active thyroid hormone called T3, which actually does all of the wonderful things that we wanted to do in the cell, right? Well, if you've disrupted cellular function with, radi with radiation crisis, right? right? Your T4 is not gonna convert well into T3. So what's happening, you're dumping a lot of precursors, but they're not converting. Right. And sometimes what happens is, which is at the worst, they flip into something that's called reverse T3, which is a dummy T3. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like folic acid it's binding a receptor that foliage should be occupying. Mm -hmm. Reverse T3 will is completely inert in essence, but it's gonna bind the receptor that needs to be activated by T3. Right. And now you don't have the energy that you need and you're not losing weight and you're not excreting waste products properly, right? So, as I said, complex question, right? Okay. But so we're looking at, we'll look at all of that. I mean, there's a lot to look at when we yeah. talk about this. <clears throat> so, I, um, I have a question about the my breast cancer was both estrogen and progesterone receptive, and my surgeon told me that it was not caused by anything I put in my body. It was something that was already there. So where does that leave me with lifestyle? I mean, does that mean that it's not going to matter? Your, your surgeon only considered the hormone as part of the cancer problem, right? And from that standpoint, that's what your body was producing. But we know that in order to have healthy hormones uh, and have them have your system work with those hormones in your body, you have to be able to break them down and excrete them properly. And, they, and then that's where lifestyle, toxins play a burden on all of them. Mm -hmm. And so there's 100% lifestyle things that you can do to support that. And not only that, but uh, not only for excreting or getting your hormones into a healthy place, but then optimizing your immune function, your cell metabolism, which both play a big role in cancer, right? Surveillance, the immune system needs to survey the area and go, that's not me, we gotta get rid of it, right? Cancer is a problem, it's not surveying it, it's not recognizing it, it's not able to keep up, right? And so, so there's other ways to support the body through that. Do you have any more to add to that? Well, you know, I mean, if that were true, then every woman would have breast cancer, right? Because you know, unless they're estrogen deficient, I mean, it really makes no sense, right? It also creates a victim, right? It's a, it's a victimized model, right? Because if you feel like you can't help your fate, like if it was your fate to have cancer, right? There's nothing you can do about it. Then you're kind of left helpless. But in reality, there's so much that you can do to control that, right? To keep it from coming back, right? So I think that it's a model that you know it's 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 simplistic yes yes estrogen drives and and progesterone to some extent drives cancer right but it drives it for 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 different reasons for instance it's not the estrogen right but it's the estrogen byproduct called 4-hydroxyestrone that drives cancer growth it's growing right which is pro-inflammatory the way that your liver breaks down the estrogen you can actually modify it so you could prevent it from going down that 4-hydroxy pathway and instead go into preventative pathway, which is, let's say, 2-hydroxy. But if you go to your surgeon and you ask him, can you tell me a little bit more about 2 and 4-hydroxyestrone, you will get a complete deer in the headlights. Mm -hmm. yeah. They have no idea. Yeah, I, I would even tell you that most OBGYNs don't know the, what, the, the fact that the estrogen is made of well, not the estrogen, but the way it breaks down, it breaks down to different pathways. So there's a great example of how you actually have control over which which pathway that takes, right? Like cruciferous vegetables, for instance, right? They literally flip. It's like a like a railroad switch. They'll flip. They'll they'll switch that railroad track in the two hydroxyestrone direction, away from the fourth. Just that simple, right? So does that help? Yeah, it does. Um, because I mean, I, I guess I would think that uh, certain women have more estrogen than others. You know, I, I've never been pregnant, so does that mean that throughout my lifetime I'm just accumulating more? 
No, it's really all about the way it breaks down and how well you break and how well you, how efficient you are at, at, uh, of an eliminator mm -hmm. of estrogen, mm -hmm. right? So if you're, so that's your genetics, that's your epigenetics, right? If your epigenetics are set up in a way that you're going to eliminate it slower, then there's more circulating, right? If you're constipated all the time, more circulating, right? If you are exposed to certain chemicals that look like they that mimic estrogens, more circular, right? You know, so see, it's it's more complex, but it's also more liberating mm -hmm. because it allows you to have options of controlling controlling things. Right? So. Yeah. Good question again. Uh, going back to that thyroid question in a person with hypothyroidism being supplemented with this T4, that's the legal thyroxine? Correct. So does the thyroid then convert that to T3? It's converted on a cellular level. The cellular level. Yeah. Okay. There's a little bit that's produced uh, by the thyroid, but most of the T3 is made when the cell, when the T4 actually enters the cell. That's why I was saying, like, if the cells are damaged, right, in the tissues, they're not, you don't have that conversion. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, when you were talking about the lymphatic system, does body brushing help at all to get rid of some of Absolutely. The There's lots of ways to move the lymphatic system. Okay. Yeah, so exercise isn't the only way. Yeah. Well, well exercise, exercise is probably the best way. It's a great way. Yeah. yeah. It's it's really effective. But body brushing absolutely does. Sawing okay. and then cold uh cold showers, so, okay. um, castor oil packs. There's lots of lots of what I call passive treatments. Mm -hmm. Can you take a question back? Um, exercise will give you the sweating. Mm -hmm. What about those of us who are on hormone therapy and have the hot flashes and, the, <laughs> and all that fun night sweating? Are we eliminating the toxins as effectively in those situations? Yeah, if you are, if when you're sweating, you're eliminating a lot of things. Uh, also, your body heating up is stimulating your immune system in various ways. But I don't know if it's this with the infrared sauna, you're actually losing cellular waste. And that's a little bit different than just normal sweating. Great yeah. question. <laughs> so, yes, yes. Um, you know, back to her question about um, the estrogen in your body. You had mentioned you didn't have any children. Right. You're never pregnant. I wanted to ask you, but so um, I've been watching, I, you know, I was diagnosed at 40, right? I had a child, my first child, 34 years old. And no one ever speaks about the elephant in the room. And nobody, all the doctors, all the, everything, everybody I talked to, no one ever mentioned about having kids later in life or not having kids at all, either because you couldn't, it was a woman's choice, what have you, mm -hmm. or you're just having kids later in life. I've been watching this for over years now. And I'll tell you, I have like 80 women on a list, famous and non-famous, and we all have one thing in common. Let me reiterate here, this does not apply to triple negative, but... <laughs> All these women, famous and non-famous, having kids later in life and not having kids at all, everyone has these estrogen progesterone positive breast cancer. And from what I learned and heard, I mean, I have like 80, I can show you. I mean, from anyone and everyone from like, um, you know, Governor Cuomo's ex-girlfriend to Melissa Etheridge, Juliana Rancic, you know, uh, Hoda, everyone on the morning shows that have breast cancer. If you look into their history, either they didn't have kids because either they couldn't, they were gay, or they had kids later in life. It's a big, big risk. During October, when they're speaking of breast cancer, not once did they ever talk about on TV when all these medical doctors come on about having children later in life. Now, you can't hold a gun to someone's head and say, listen, if you don't have, you know, I mean, you can't inflict fear. I get that. But my point is, nobody's talking about it. And nobody's um, telling women that this is a risk. And it is because it's getting, the list is getting longer and longer. And I, from what my understanding, you know, I'm not a doctor, but like, from my understanding, it's the breast cells. Your breast cells remain, they're immature. Sure. The longer they remain immature, the worse it is to increase your risk of getting breast cancer. You want to mature them by pregnancy. If you mature them, you stabilize them, therefore they return. You know, I mean, you don't run that risk. And, you know, now you think back like to a birth control pill, right? Mm -hmm. Women went on birth control pills either to like make their ovaries think they're pregnant, right? So people get pregnant. Your ovaries think you're pregnant, you know, they don't, I guess, produce the or something, right? Yeah. Where is something for women? Again, you know, I'm racking my brains for all kinds of breast cancers. And this is what's really hard about breast cancer. There's a couple different kinds, you know, you could go triple negative that you almost like, you know, for the girl that never smoked and got lung cancer. Like, you know, that's why I look at triple negative, it just happens. 
If that just happened, breast cancer would probably be like one in 25. Breast cancer is almost like one in seven now. And to me, that's a war on women. That this is this is a pandemic, and, and nobody's paying attention to all this. And I always say, like, why can't they come up with something like a pill? Now again, by choice, because I mean, if you have high cholesterol, people choose to take Lipitor. It sure. is what it is. A pill that stay, makes your breast think that you are pregnant, stabilizes those cells, and therefore, you know, just like a, a girl that takes birth control. You know what I mean? Like, they don't talk about this. Yes, and I'll tell you, like I said, I did this list, and I'm also on this website. You should see all the women, again, for the estrogen progesterone positive. That all put that role. Yeah, well, we do it's know that breastfeeding is definitely preventative yeah. for breast cancer. Um, and I'm seeing from 27 and up. 27 is considered old to have a kid, believe it or not. I mean, that's when actually I, everybody that I looked at and researched was 27 and older that had their first kid and had estrogen for dogs. So possibly, yeah, or did it kick off? I wonder. I wonder about if we if there were surveillance checking their levels of hormones and how they were. It's, it's a thing. Like you know, I mean, it's, I think it's, it's, you make a good point. I mean, it definitely <laughs> there is definitely a breast sensitivity that's happening. Yeah, but. I guess for the point we're making is that by serving the genetic expressions, right, and by controlling other factors, you could still modify that. The problem is that right, right. there's that, right? So you have all these women that, let's say, have never had kids, but all of these women, no one's looking at their epigenetics, right? No one is looking at their environment. No one is looking at everything else they're doing. Right. And if they were, that number probably would go down significantly. Right. Um, I can tell you, I never ate meat in my life. I was always a vegetarian. I was younger. I stopped wearing deodorant in fear of breast cancer. I never smoked. I barely drink. I mean, like, I drink reverse osmosis water. So I don't have the chemicals. Going, you know what I mean? Like, I can't even, I mean, I exercise and... 40 years old thing, you know, that was the things, you know, it was like, oh, I'm glad, you know, well, I'm glad yeah, I all that. Is the thing is that there is no, there's no, um, there's no magic, there's no, oh. you can do everything right and you can still have illness knows no time. I mean, you know, we all have time, you know, it's just, it, what's aggravating is this was happening stuff. to men at a rate like this and men were losing their chest, radiation, chemo, tamoxifen, and all this good stuff. You know, I get a little jaded about that. I'm a little mad. You know, I understand prostate cancer is there. I get it. But it's a different cancer. But it's a different cancer. You know, I mean, this really, this is not like, you know, it's not an easy thing. You know, we have a couple in the back of the therapy. I was just going to also mention, like, I, I have a theory about oral contraceptives. We use it so widely in the United States and it's artificial hormones. And if you like look at a graph when oral contraceptives were um, introduced in the United States versus breast cancer, like they yeah. mimic, mimic yeah. each other. And I, I do that. Together, right? I have a SICA, so um, technically it supposedly reduces your risk of ovarian cancer, but I really am going to encourage my daughters to never take oral contraceptives. It's, it's highly inflammatory and it does, it does definitely. Because right, the estrogen feeds it. For it. But if you have it set up, like she was saying, you know, the estrogen feeds it. And know, it's not and natural estrogen. It's not natural. Right. 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 And, and it's a xenoestrogen, right? It's an outside source of estrogen and it definitely plays a big role. Uh, you mentioned uh, infrared sauna, mm -hmm. which is a sauna that's heated up by infrared light. Yes. Is that, does that have a different effect than the sauna that's heated by yes. a fire? Yep, yeah, good question. So the infrared wavelength can actually penetrate into the cells, um, uh, into the skin a little bit. And so it does activate the, those wavelengths activate detoxification from the cells. Whereas if you're just in a hot sauna, either a steam or a dry, you're going to sweat and you're going to increase your immune system and you're going to get toxins out uh, of your body, but it doesn't stimulate the cells in the same way. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So it is a little bit more effective. That's interesting. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, a question about the infrared that you talked about. I had room with edema and I was told that I needed to go into the sauna. Sure. Is, yeah, this is something safe. Or you way? should probably do some lymphatic mm -hmm. movement in a safe fashion. <laughs> first, <laughs> absolutely. Yep. You want to get your lymphatics moving first yeah. um, before you try to um, get toxins out. In other words, you're just dumping into that lymphatic system that's not moving. You're just going to sit more on your toxins. Yeah. Good question. Sorry. So many toxins. Okay. I've been reading about higher dose iodine supplement. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what's your take on that. Uh, there's a book called The Iodine Crisis. And she says it's the perfect storm for breast cancer and other cancers mm -hmm. that started with them removing the iodine from our food and they replaced it with bromine. 
And um, so we have iodine deficiency and all the bromine in our food and in the environment is fooling our receptors to thinking we have enough iodine. Fluoride and bromide yeah. uh, the uh, and iodine are all halogens and they can definitely fill the same receptors. Right. Um, as far as high dose iodine, do you do any of that with your... I don't do much high dose iodine, but again, we're nutritionally deplete in so many things. We really only get iodine from iodine salt mm -hmm. or things from the sea. The salt, the iodine is evaporated in the salt, she said, which means it's exposed to air. So you can't count on the, the iodized salt is also considered to be very inflammatory. Yeah, I, mean, it's you know, I, I, I mean, you're uh, definitely recommend. We always recommend sea salts, right? You know, not, not iodized salt. Right. It's you know there are a lot of things that that have some controversy to them in, in this field, and and iodine is definitely one of them. You know, because you can read just as much literature about iodine causing inflammation of issues. As not, you know. So for every book that talks about iodine deficiency, there's going to be a book that talks about an iodine problem. Well, yeah, that's tough. tough. That's a tough. It's a, a tough. Yeah. Yeah. A lot. So. People don't know much about it. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I think Dr. Kaplan thought he, he just touched upon it. So I often recommend kelp powder or um, sea salt. Yeah, iodine in the natural form is yeah. is healthy. Yeah. yeah, we want to make sure people are having it. It is absolutely important for us health. Right. Mm -hmm. And thyroid. It's really more when it's in a supplement that it's a problem. Mm -hmm. That's the issue. And it comes from the right. Yeah. So you had another question. <laughs> yeah. Amy, did you have another question? I did have a question. How long have you been practicing integrative health? Yeah, so um, since as long as I've been trained, because I'm naturopath. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I tell people I'm, a, I'm like the original integrative therapist or uh, doctor. Uh, I graduated in 2017. So I started as a, so I'm an osteopath by training, which means I'm already kind of starting with a, a more holistic slant, albeit very conventional in the sense that you're still prescribing the same kind of medicines, but there is a whole touch and feel component and there's a whole component of understanding kind of how the, how the body works as a unit you know and then uh in the, my residency was in physical medicine rehabilitation which is probably the most holistic of specialties because again in that particular specialty you are trained to to improve a function and status of the entire individual so you're looking at everything you know um and then uh, what I what I ended up doing is I ended up uh, continuing my training and 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 becoming an interventional physical medicine real doc, which means I was able to do blocks and injections and all these different techniques and then ultrasound guided procedures. And um, <clears throat> I started that in 2003, all the way up to 2014. At which point I found that to be extremely limiting and extremely. Uh, disenchanted, you know, uh, because it, it just was not helping me take care of the whole individual, you know. So I started my practice in 2014. Uh, and then I think I, I became certified as an integrative doc in 2015. Uh, so I've been, you know, and, and it was it was not even a choice, right? It was almost, it was essential, right? Because mm -hmm. as soon as I started working in more holistic medical approach and I again I, what I what I started doing really is more holistic kind of regenerative treatments because I do a lot of like stem cells and platelets and those kind of things very quickly realized that I can't just treat the area the person's coming and complaining of I have to treat the whole person mm -hmm. because if I can't take care of their immune system and I can't take care of their inflammation then whatever I'm doing for their area that's hurting them is not going to really be that effective, you know, and then that just kind of grew and blossomed and it's just continuing to grow. But that's so I've been, you know, it's 2015, really, maybe 2014, dabbling a little bit, and then it's just getting more and more intense, you know. So, it's a very good field. our scope is uh, between Dr. Kaplan and myself, our it's endless, endless. Thoughts, right? For for a patient, we collaborate a lot on patients because you're all complex. We're all complex bodies walking around. Um, <clears throat> no, 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 no questions here. Oh, okay. Okay. Right, yeah. um, 
Does anybody have any more questions? We typically do stop at about this time or a button. Well, I was just going to make a quick little uh, that signatura test that we're talking about. Since you know this was kind of like the uh, part of the, the topic, uh, it was a signatura. Signatura is a test that checks for circulating tumor cells or the DNA of the circulating tumor cells. It's actually a free test, which is kind of interesting, right? Uh, and it will pick up a recurrence of a tumor eight months before imaging. That's very important to understand. That's a powerful thing, eight months before imaging, right? So, so when you're talking about, uh, and the, so again, it could be used as an active monitoring tool. What they do is they will take a biopsy specimen from the tissue that was biopsied during surgery or biopsy, let's say a breast, they do other tests, right? And then they're going to match type that to the blood that we collect from that person, right? So now they know exactly what the tumor looked like genetically because they have the biopsy, right? Uh, the hospital will keep that specimen for seven years, right? So after seven years, it's problematic, right? Or within seven years. And then it's recommended that women, let's say breast cancer survivors, right? Women are tested uh, initially every six months and eventually like once a year. Right. So, and that's a powerful test. That's a, that's a game changer in the test. I mean, it's it really, because it's the, there's really nothing else that can pick up cancer that early. That's the, let's say it was going to recur. It's going to recur. So it's important. Can you just say that again? You just said that the person who has to have a tissue biopsy along with the blood test. It has, you have to have a tissue for test. For that test, you have to have you have to have some tissue from the biopsy for them to analyze, to understand but the, you the need genetic. But blood sample at the same time. No, no. So that you know what the blood level is at, at that. No, not at the same time. No, no, no. You, you, you analyze the genetic makeup of that tumor once. And once they've analyzed it, they have that recorded. And then you routinely test the blood over years from that, based on that one analysis of the tissue, right? And how does the blood test then correlate to the analysis of the blood tissue, of, of the, because, the tissue? Because you we, know, the blood test has got to say, oh, now I'm coordinating with the tissue or I'm not. No, no. The, the blood test will show the same genetic, if the cancer is coming back, let's say if you're monitoring- Oh, it's the same genetic makeup as the, the initial yeah, circulating oh, Okay, so that's why it's called circulating- Tumor cells. So that means you have got you got a meeting by and if you, if you survive long- in how do you do it? Unfortunately, 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 that's why- it's you know it's so important for everyone that's recently diagnosed to get this test done, right? Because now this test has only been around for about four or five years, right? So it wasn't an option for women that had their cancer seven years earlier, right? You know what I'm saying? So, but now that we have this technology, now we get to get to take advantage. Of it. So the hospitals will release this tissue. Yes. For they have to. Okay. Oh yeah, that's your tissue. It's not there. <laughs> <laughs> They're just holding it. Well, oh, they will release. They have to legally release. Well, I just go through it. The lab, the lab company does that. If you sign a release for that biopsy, you sign away your rights for that tissue. But they, what I've been told. but they always release it. That's not an issue. So the company does the work. We fill out the paperwork. We get the biopsy report. Okay, the biopsy report actually lists the slides, the thickness of the slides, the serial number of that specimen. That gets sent to the lab. The lab does all the legwork. The lab contacts the hospital, requests a slide. They release the slide. The slide goes to the company and then they match it to the board. So it's kind of similar to like an oncotype class here. Yes, it is similar to oncotype how they do it. Yeah. I just had a question. Where is the lab that does 
Signatara? Mm, I don't know where they were located. It's 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 it, it's male, it's male. Okay, so it's not local. No, it's not there. Yeah, it's it's a national one. Yeah. Um, you were speaking earlier about um, you know, different things being available to the human cells or to the cancer cells. Yeah. Are cancer cells not human? No. <laughs> <laughs> Cancer cells are, well, cancer cells never die, right? So that makes them inhuman, right? You know, that's, that's how they're able to grow, right? But this is why we always focus on, like, prevention. Like, for instance, Dr. Kim mentioned that uh, alcohol, for instance, right, you know, actually prevents, uh, helps cells, or cancer cells to, to not die, right? Because our body is always trying to induce death onto the cancer cell, but the cancer cell blocks that. It's, there's all that's the constant battle, right? And certain things that we put in our bodies can either help that battle or, you know, one way or the other, right? But the hallmark of a cancer cell is that it loses the, it, it blocks the ability for self destruction, yeah. which aging cells have. That's how we get rid of aging and infective cells through self death, right? Called apoptosis, right? So they're not really human, right? That sense. They also don't use the same messaging. They don't use the same energy. The energy, the, they don't metabolize energy the same way that, that normal cells do this. Yeah. So they don't, they don't age and die on their own. They, they typically do not age and die on their own. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. Thanks, guys. Okay, yeah. Thank you. But uh, we have to have you back for sure. Uh -huh. exactly. And thank you also for the pens and the information and the data and everything. The your for fascinating discussion. Okay, so at this point, um, I just want to remind everyone.